Welcome to a look ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is a very interesting one in my opinion. It's a series about the great controversy and it's entitled Rebellion and Redemption. This particular lesson is lesson number nine in that series for February 27 of 2016 entitled the Great Controversy in the Early Church. I think you'll find it very interesting. I certainly did. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, for us to study through the challenges that you have faced with your human children is quite phenomenal. To think about the difficulties that we made for ourselves, even in this story, is, is quite amazing. Help us not to fall into the traps that the early disciples did, but rather may we have the Pentecostal experience in our day leading up to the latter reign is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. How difficult was it for Jesus to convince his very own disciples that he was going to be crucified <coughs> and he was going to be handed over to the Romans and crucified and die, and he was not going to be the king that they wanted? Did you find it easy to do? Yeah. Should we say very difficult? Yeah. But the only reference we have is what, in Mark 9? Oh no, there's several of us. But he says, the Son of Man will be delivered into the hands of the men, they will kill him. When he is killed after three days he will rise. But they did not understand the saying, and they were afraid were to ask him. Were there any disciples on the road to Emmaus, or was that an entirely group of people? That was that, after. That was a couple more disciples, yeah, that not among the, the 11 or 12. From what um, we have, it seems like it ran for most of his ministry. Yeah. Well, let me just give a couple of examples. He also had a terrible time convincing them that their ministry was, went, was supposed to go beyond the, the Jews. The idea that they should go out and preach the gospel to Gentiles was almost unthinkable. Let me just uh, give you a couple passages that you must be very familiar with. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Go then to all peoples everywhere. Shouldn't that be perfectly obvious? And make them my disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And I will be with you always to the end of the age. And then back to our question about how well he did it, convincing. Well, let me, let me just, just read this. The greatest barrier Jesus faced with his followers was their preconceived opinions. This is from our Bible study guide. The disciples took little notice of what Jesus said if it did not fit with their own ideas of who he should be. Right up to the time of his ascension, the disciples still quizzed Jesus about freeing Israel from the Romans. It was only in the ten days of prayer and close fellowship in the presence of God that dominant preconceptions were finally beginning to be replaced with the truth. And the disciples were ready to hear what God told them. This paved the way for the incredible events at that first Pentecost after the death of Jesus. Let me just read you what happened, not in those last days, but the last day, well, the last week anyway, before the crucifixion. They are now traveling from Jericho up to Jerusalem in the final ascent before crucifixion week. Jesus took the twelve disciples aside and said to them, I'm reading from Luke 18, verses 31 to 34, and said to them, Listen, we are going to Jerusalem, where everything the prophets wrote about the Son of Man will come true. He will be handed over to the Gentiles, is that hard to understand? Who will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. They will whip him and kill him, but three days later he will rise to life. Are there any words in there that are hard to understand? No. Well, but if you're used to reading the Old Testament and some of the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah and him coming as a king and these other and things. And if you want to be prime minister. And, and, and thinking those may have had um, metaphorical okay. uh, uh, um, in, intentions or meanings and maybe they would think, well, he's just doing the same thing here. Maybe oh. all of this is just metaphorical. But Don't we all have preconceived ideas, though? Yeah, we do. That's the Everybody. problem. Well, 
What changes them is is probably reality after the fact. Well, not re how do you know well, when reality comes? Look, look at what it's look. when something comes and tells you your old idea isn't going to work, mm -hmm. and not until then are you going to change your mind. How are you going to change your mind? Just by somebody's word. Well, that's and good. how do you know if their word, if you're understanding what they're talking about? And I quote Luke 18, the, ver the, 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 the punchline, but the disciples did not understand any of these things. The meaning of the words was hidden from them, and they did not know what Jesus was talking about. Now, it was hidden from them. Sounds like something... That leaves you to decide why do you think it was hidden. It sounds like it wasn't passive, whatever happened. It was something that actually came and hid it from them. Yeah. Uh, usually, so, usually, my, usually when I read something like that, I think, well, somebody hid it from them. And if you read the text more, a little, little more closely, the intention there is that they just didn't see it. Someone didn't hide it from them. Okay. It was hidden because they didn't see it. Is it possible that the devil hid it from them? Well, and Jesus, you know, he talked in, in um, allegories and metaphors mm -hmm. and parables, and he said some of that's hidden. Well, but this isn't an allegory, a parable. I mean, you know, it's pretty blunt language. Well, but it, it, every it has time a, we read the Bible, do we not find something different? And you go, yeah. I've read this several times, and I never saw it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when you when you think about it, most of them weren't educated. Yeah. So maybe we could put the current colloquialism: they weren't the sharpest knives in the drawer. Well, we're going to talk about that. How well, many pre how, who who actually had it right? There's no indication in here except Jesus that had it right. Yeah, sure. And and so why are we so hard on them for for sticking with well because an idea that they were brought up with, that everybody knew about, with all the theologians knew about, and all that. Why are we so hard on them? Something's got to happen to change everybody's mind, their paradigm. It's got to, something's got to happen to make this that is, shift. This is at least the third and probably the fourth time recorded, not counting how many times it is not recorded, right. when Jesus specifically told them exactly how many times. I mean, he's the greatest teacher who's ever lived on this planet. And these are 12 men that spend their time with him day and night for at least two years. The, the, the last one to join him spent two years. The one some of them has spent three and a half years following him around. There's two things that could be possible. Either they were really stupid or Jesus was trying to show all of us, even now, today, that we will stick with our own ideas until something changes them. So which one is it? How many preconceived opinions do we hold that are in error? Matthew's I don't know how many are you holding. Matthew That's 17. a good question. <laughs> Matthew 17 relates the same story, but yeah. the last sentence is they were greatly distressed. So that, you know, something was going on, but they, it's probably they didn't want to believe what they were hearing yeah. because it just didn't fit with their yeah, paradigm. That's why they probably didn't <laughs> ask him further because it, it sounded like, you know, it's, it's going to be more bad news, so why should we ask him? If, what, where did our preconceived ideas come from? Basically, we've just put them together because of past experiences, but it doesn't mean it's right. And our teachers. Do we teachers, choose yeah. to believe them because we want to believe them? Sometimes. Once you've got a nice package put together, it's, it's uh, comfortable, and you don't have to think. think yeah, but how can work. you use that to... to it's not ex good how can you How can you use that to check yourself? I mean, because well. I want... I want what I believe to turn out to be true, mm -hmm. but I'm trying to well, look out for things just in case I'm wrong, which if, I if, might be. Yeah. If, you, if you teach classes mm -hmm. at all, like I do on stuff that people think they know, you run into people all the time who have a different opinion. So what do you do? Well, you know, it's kind of like Myra said. She reads and she comes across things that she's read many times. and. Uh, all of a sudden, something dawns on you. So um, that's the way your, many of your preconceptions are, are altered. Do, do any of our preconceived opinions have a satanic origin? Boy. Well, <laughs> not, not, well how not, do you answer that? How do you answer that? Well, I, mean, I mean, how are you supposed to answer that? 
because because that could happen any time, or it may never happen at all. I don't know. When you think of some of the early translators and their backgrounds, I think here and there we've come to the conclusion that maybe there are some shady areas. Well, well, there's, there have to be. I mean, unless you say every uh, uh, errant idea is of the devil then the only other option is that, well, some of them have to be, some preconceived. Ideas. Okay, let's, 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 let me just take a, an example. How many popul popularly believed Christian doctrines have a satanic, uh, satanic origin? How do you know when they're satanic? I, I need to answer that first. Okay, well, I'll, I'll give you an idea. The devil said right at the beginning, the very first pages of Scripture, you will not surely die. How many Christians believe that? Well, well by depends, far the majority. It depends what you mean by that. Well, what do you mean by that? I mean you won't die. You may live forever in hell, but you're not going to die. Well, when he said that, when she said that, she says that when, she, that when they eat the apple, we will die. Mm -hmm. God said that. That's true. And did they? And Satan said, no, you won't die. But did they no, die? I'm talking about what Satan said. I'm not talking about what she no, said. No, I'm trying to get at your answer there. Okay. You said you said that, that he just told a lie, but they, they she didn't she didn't die during that time, did she? Death began. Well, it's a process. She, she, okay, uh, we could get into a big long discussion. God had two or three choices, and one choice was not to let them die at that point, but to give them a time to try to figure out what mistakes they had made. And so that was his choice. He could have let them die right on the spot, and that would have been a just and fair conclusion, because that's what he told them. But he did not. He did not. He did not. So was Satan telling the truth right then? Well, well Adam so isn't running around on the earth today. No, he sure is. Well, death. that's my point. That's why I said, what do you mean by that? What do you mean that you sh will surely die? Will you die in the long run, or will you die after you eat the fruit? Oh, well, either case, it was after the fruit. Yeah. He told a half truth, and she went for it. Yeah. <coughs> well, well, it's kind of hard well, to... What, what Ken is saying is that, um, is what I understand yeah. it, is that Adam and Eve would have died instantly. Yeah. But God stepped in for whatever purposes or reasons, and... Uh, and, um, because it was a, it, it was a, it was really the only choice he had. If you stop to think uh, about it, if he had said, "Well, uh, I'll let it pass this time," what is he saying? He's saying sin doesn't really matter. If he says, "Okay, you're going to zap you, bam, right now because you've been disobeyed," the rest of the universe looking on would say, "Whoa." Yes. Any any way, way you want to, any way you want to interpret that, um, uh, there's there are several ways to interpret it, and it'll all be be correct. They would have died instantly, but God chose to, or it was a prolap prolonged death, or or die at the hand of someone else. But um, but, but, de but death was the consequence. Does Ellen White say they would have died instantly? Um, how do we get that? If it was any, how, how are we so sure about that? If it was anything like they, what had happened previously with the war in heaven. For God to keep them alive uh, and sustain them until almost a thousand years later, perhaps, uh, it was in keeping with what had already happened. Yeah, but we, we made the brash statement. I mean, everybody's listening to us, so probably thinking, well, where, where did you get that, that they would die right after they ate the fruit? It, I mean, how do you, how do you come up with that? Ellen White discusses that in some detail. I, I, I can't quote you verbatim right on the spot. Yeah. Well, yeah, the angels are created beings too. He could have snuffed out that third right there. Yeah. Same same reason he didn't. That and would have even been worse. You yeah. get to Jeremiah 10, verse 11, it goes like this. Thus you say to them, the gods, the Elohim, who did not make the heavens and the earth, shall perish from the earth and from under the heavens. Mm -hmm. The same warning that he gave to, uh, uh, to Adam and Eve, uh, and it's another place in Jeremiah, I think it's uh, Jeremiah 7.31, it says basically the same thing. Also, Psalms 82.7 yeah. says the and, same and, thing. And what about worshiping on Sunday? Was that it? Can you give any evidence that that was God's idea? Is it wrong to worship on Sunday? That's not the question. The question is, who, <laughs> no, whose idea it was, it? was it? The question is, is whose idea was it? You can worship any day. When you, when you, 
keep the first commandment. You, you love God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your soul. You, you worship Him all the time. So how would you call a person who worships on Sunday that being satanic? If they didn't know any different, they wouldn't be held accountable. Well, there's, you there's know no, and I know that this devil was behind that. We know the organization. There's, there's nothing, wrong with, being. nothing wrong with worshiping on Sunday or Monday or no. Tuesday when people have morning devotions or evening devotions or they carry out their life in a proper way they're worshiping. But you don't supplant that with a Saturday, with a Saturday worship. Well, here's the question. To answer your question, Gary, to, to a certain extent and come back more to our lesson, the disciples had a radical change in their paradigm over crucifixion weekend. What happened? Well, it's like Gary said, you have this, uh, this um, <coughs> awe moment, this uh, <laughs> aha moment. Yeah. It's kind of like what he was referring to earlier. There's something that happens that snaps it all into, snaps it all into okay. focus. In this case, it was, a, it was a, a death that they just did not think was going to happen. Well, it doesn't and fit their paradigm. Yeah, and a resurrection. Right, yeah. It didn't fit their paradigm, that's but, right. But even at that, I, you know, I refer to the road, on, the, 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 road, the, the journey on the road to Emmaus. That, that story is there, people walking along, they still didn't understand. And mm -hmm. Jesus shows up there and starts going through from the Old Testament all the way through. And that's the, we think, they would know. <laughs> yeah. And even in Acts 1, 6, I think it is, yeah. just before the ascension, mm -hmm. the disciples said, are you now going to become king yeah. of the Jews? They well, didn't get it. How many times do you think Jesus met with the disciples between Resurrection Sunday and 10 days before Pentecost? There was a 40-day period there. It says many times. We don't know how many of this. We have recorded, I believe, seven times. But would that be, is that many? I, I'm not sure. But then in those last 10 days before Pentecost, something happened. What was that that happened? They met together, they studied, they prayed diligently, and the Holy Spirit came on them. Yeah, yeah exactly. Wow. And they, they that, changed. The, yeah, exactly. They came up against a situation that they realized that their preconceived opinions could not be true. They wanted them to be true, but they could not be true. They didn't see any way it could happen that way. So is that, is that how it works? You have your preconceived data and information and <coughs> well, that, finally it just doesn't work and so then you change your mind? Isn't, isn't there some other way to come to, to come to conclusions before you encounter the disaster? <laughs> <laughs> what happened to Paul? Yeah. Well, same story. He's struck down. Yeah, not it, yeah that was well. But that's pretty dramatic. Not a, you know, some people come to their senses <laughs> when we hold an evangelistic meeting. There are a few people that come, and we say, "Come to the front," and they make uh, they make a decision. Mm. Uh, that's nice. Is, is but there are others who don't. Um, the information <coughs> is the same. So. Uh, we, uh, what do we say about these people who do uh, come to their senses? Gary suggested a moment ago, a little while ago, that maybe these guys weren't too well educated. Is that the problem? Well, well educated how? You know, this, I read this you idea, you got to have a college education to be educated. Uh, well, <laughs> there's a pretty, I've known some pretty smart farmers who <coughs> didn't have a college education yeah. and other other people. And I think the times back then were a whole lot different. We, yeah. We've, for the last several hundred years, we've had access to stuff, and these days it just blows your mind with what you can get to. Yeah. But back in Christ's time, we're a little different. And, and remember, I'm not, I don't have the quotation right in front of me now, in previous lessons <coughs> we read that Jesus picked out people said, well, in other words, he puts up in these words, he says, among the common walks of life, there are people walking behind a plow who could be among the world's greatest men if they just knew that they had those hidden talents, they put them to use. And uh, Jesus picked those kind of people to be his disciples. How many years did it take the Adventist church to send international missionaries? You weren't supposed to ask that. <laughs> 30 years before we sent, and where we sent them, we sent them to the 
home home country of the Protestant Reformation. <clears throat> so why did it take so long? What were they? What was their pre preconceived notion? Their idea was first of all they thought, okay, God would never expect us to go beyond our local people that we know, and then they said, well, when it talks about going to the whole world. It must mean we'll we'll reach all we'll reach people from all over the world who have come to the United States. And then finally they said, well, maybe we should try going to some other countries. Yeah, it took them twenty years to kind of formalize a regular church too. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, they didn't have a didn't even have a church organization so for did, almost twenty years. So did Jesus pick these disciples because they had? the least amount of preconceived ideas? Well, that may be part of the answer. Yeah. So if you have a preconceived... Uh, you know, it's almost as if we're justifying <laughs> preconceived ideas. You have to wait until you have some kind of a... We need in to this I, case, somebody has to die on a cross before you can come to your senses. Maybe I should bring a two-by-four and BAM! <laughs> <laughs> well, why would you change? Why would you change anyway just by... Would you um, you think you you'll change just by studying? Is that the idea? I mean, when you study something, you have to interpret it based on your yeah. experience. Hopefully, some of us will learn without having to make all the mistakes ourselves. Well, you know, I bet I bet some of it has to do with the in, the earnestness of your heart. Yeah. In this case, and your willingness to the, admit that you might be wrong. Right. In this case, it would be easy for us to conclude the disciples were so anxious to, to have this earthly kingdom that the, that's the way they wanted it. Yeah. They, uh, let me read a couple more passages. This is Acts one, verses ten and eleven. They still had their eyes fixed on the sky as he went away, when two men notice the expression dressed in white, suddenly stood beside them and said, Galileans, why are you standing there looking up at the sky? This Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way that you saw him go to heaven. And Ellen has some interesting things to say about that. What do we know about these two men who spoke to the disciples as Jesus ascended into heaven? They were two of the most exalted angels in heaven. And they had been given the task of serving as Christ's guardian angels while he was here on this earth. That's Desire of Ages, 832, <coughs> paragraph 1, and 788, paragraph 3, up to 789, paragraph 4, and 793, paragraph 1. Several passages talk about these two guardian angels. So why do you think Jesus needed two guardian angels? Well, various intervals. They, they would have killed Christ right on the spot. Was it because that God recognized <coughs> Jesus would need special protection from the attacks of Satan and his angels while on this earth? Oh, I think so. Man, I don't know. That sounds, that sounds kind of like he was getting special treatment. I don't well, necessarily get that special treatment. We have guardian angels. Why not Christ? Well, well but I mean, I mean, we know about multiple times when the devil tried to kill him. I mean, do you have that kind of story behind you? Well, I mean, the devil, I about, was, de the devil was trying to kill him before he even hardly had taken a few breaths. I mean, back when he's born. And that experience was for the benefit of the onlooking universe, too. It wasn't that he, he has to show how he deals with finite the, beings. And the so. rest of the universe had to see yep. what Satan's real nature was. That's why we're talking about the great controversy. Okay. Oh, the reason for two? <laughs> Well, but so, I mean, know, why not four? It's our, it's my, oh, what? Oh. it's my understanding that, uh, you know, anytime I need help, I, God will send down whatever angels I need. Yeah, that's true. That's right. But two is enough, I think, because we know that those two came, that passage I said to you there, it's uh, the one in Desire of Ages 832, paragraph one. When Jesus was lying dead in the tomb, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit later, but lying dead in the tomb, Satan said, our only final hope is to claim that this body is dead. It's now our possession. We're not going to let him get out of this grave. And two angels came down from heaven, and when they arrived, Satan and all his evil angels just scattered. There was nothing they could do. So I think two was enough. Well, they used to be angels too. Yeah, they still were. 
just on the wrong side of things. But um, well, and, and so the yeah, the question you is, have one that says that they're leaving. why did <laughs> why did you have two come after them? I mean, think about if you're on Satan's side, there's nothing you would want more than to keep that grave shut. I'm sure every angel on Satan's side was there trying to keep that place shut, and they just scattered when God's angel showed. Why? They knew what they were up against. Well, why would they even try in the first place? Well, insanity. They, insanity. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Or say, Jesus. Jesus came out of there by his own power, not yeah. by the power of the angels. One angel rolled back the stone, and the other one said, "Your father calls you." And the angel probably wasn't necessary to roll back the stone. Jesus probably could have <laughs> well, done that as well. Those stones were designed in a way you were not supposed to be able to open them yeah. from inside. Big stones. <laughs> well, you're not supposed to be able to raise yourself from the dead either. No. <laughs> create the universe and create well, life. Getting, <laughs> yeah, getting back to the disciples, what happened during those 10 days of weeping and praying together? That's a big what? shaking adjustment. Were they ready to you preach know? the gospel to the Gentiles at the end of those 10 days? Absolutely not. No way. Did they know that they could speak different languages? Well, that was one of the questions. Do you think they spoke any more than one language before Pentecost? No. Well, if they weren't if they weren't qualified to preach the gospel then, how is it that they had been sent out at least two times previously to do that? Heal the sick, raise the three, dead. Three times to Galilee and one time to Priya that we know about. And no, there uh, may have been more. They were they were successful in some of them. Yeah, oh yeah. Partially yeah. successful. Yeah. We know Luke probably spoke, well, we, he must have, two or three languages. Well, Christ probably spoke two, at least two, Hebrew and Aramaic, and maybe some of the Latin. Well, he spoke, there's some evidence he spoke Greek as well. I mean, you know, he grew up a couple miles from a Roman established. He probably may have spoken Latin as well. He, I'm sure he was building things for, for the, the city that was arising over there at Sepphoris, which was just a sh very short distance from Nazareth. So most of the disciples probably had to speak Greek, Koine Greek, and Aramaic at least to get around in, in life. Just to survive before Christ yeah. got there. Well, certainly Latin as well, wouldn't it? Yeah. Maybe. Um, I think with the Roman occupation. Yeah. And possibly. Well, just as the Holy Spirit hovered over the earth at that creation in, in Genesis 1, he hovered over the disciples at Pentecost, and the result was incredible. Uh, we know the story. I don't know why I should read it again. Well, let's just do. There were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews. I'm reading from my Good News Bible. This is Acts 2, verses 5 to 12. There were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. And I guess this is actually Ellen White's comments on, on that. Uh, this is Acts the Apostles 39, verse, uh, page 39 to 40. During the dispersion, the Jews had been scattered to almost every part of the inhabited world, and in their exile they had learned to speak various languages. Many of these Jews were on this occasion in Jerusalem attending the religious festivals then in progress. Every known language was represented by those assembled. This diversity of languages would have been a great hindrance to the proclamation of the gospel. God, therefore, in a miraculous manner, supplied the deficiency of the apostles. The Holy Spirit did, not, uh, did for them that which they could not have accomplished for themselves in a lifetime. They could now proclaim the truths of the gospel abroad, speaking with accuracy the languages of those for whom they were laboring. This miraculous gift was a strong evidence to the world that their commission bore the signet of heaven. From this time forth, the language of the disciples was pure, simple, and accurate, whether they were spoken in their native tongue or in a foreign language. Just incredible. I have had the challenge, if you might call it, or the, or the privilege of practicing medicine in five different languages in my life. So I know a little bit about what that's like. Um, what do we know about those who became Christians soon after the Pentecost experience? Think of any interesting stories 
right up front? Well, a lot of the Jews didn't want to uh, abandon a lot of their uh, customs. And? Led to some friction here and there. Look at these two verses that we often overlook. They're just a couple of verses, but they might throw a lot of light on our understanding of the early Christian church. Acts 6, verse 7, And so the word of God continued to spread. The number of disciples grew larger and larger, and a great number of priests accepted the faith. Who were the priests in Jesus' day? Sadducees. Mostly Sadducees in Jerusalem. The ones that don't believe in the resurrection. Et cetera, et cetera. That's not all. Look at Acts 15, verse 5. But some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said the Gentiles must be circumcised and told to obey the law of Moses. What kind of believers are these? They still belong to the party of the Pharisees? Well, what does that tell us? So groups from uh, of the two most ardent opponents, opponents, yes, of Jesus during his lifetime, the uh, Pharisees and Sadducees, some of them were converted. But mostly about Christ, they hadn't abandoned the rest of it by the sound. Of it. <laughs> yeah, um, some men came from Judea to Antioch and started teaching the believers: you cannot be saved unless you are circumcised, as the law of Moses requires. Who do you suppose those people were? Acts 15, 1. Even after his third missionary journey, when Paul arrived at Jerusalem with that huge offering from the Gentiles to help those who are suffering in Judea, church leaders, these are Christians, this is not Jews, Christian leaders, church leaders. Um, let's see, where are we here? Um, in, 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 in Jerusalem, told Paul, if you want to really be with us, you need to do that thing with shaving your head and pay for these people to go and go through the ceremony. And what was the result? Paul was arrested and spent most of the rest of his life in prison. It was the church leaders who insisted he do that. And Ellen White says, Acts of the Apostles 405, paragraph 1, he was not authorized by God to compromise as much as he did. Compromise with who? Church leaders. Oh dear, I shouldn't have said that, should I? <laughs> well, I wonder what was motivating them to do that. They thought they knew how the gospel should be spread and they wanted it to be done. I mean, you can read it, it's, the whole story is there. They thought the gospel should be promoted the way they wanted it to be promoted. They didn't, they thought this Paul guy was completely out of control and they were going to bring him back into line. Read it for yourself. Could it be that um, it was a way to try to reduce trouble within the ranks? Well, because I... Yeah, well, trouble <laughs> within the ranks. So who were the ranks? The ranks were Pharisees and Sadducees who had become Christians. That's true, but uh, the reason why it would, could have been unanimous, and, and even Paul decided to go that direction, is that this could reduce trouble. And then it ends up it causing certainly. more trouble. Exactly. Well, Acts 4 is an interesting chapter, and we, I, I'm sure you're all somewhat familiar with it, but remember that it starts out with Peter and John <coughs> traveling to the temple, and what happened? They healed the man who was crippled, and then he had a big argument with the, with the leaders of, the, church, of the, the Jews at that point in time. They arrested them, put them in prison, and they went the next morning to pull them out of prison so they could try them, and they weren't there. Where were they? Doing it again. <laughs> they were back at the temple <laughs> preaching away. Uh, I, that, you know, to watch this is going to be fascinating when we get to see it. Anyway, the Prussian rulers saw that Christ was extolled above them. This is, this, is comment, this is comment from Ellen White about Acts 4. As the Sadducees who did not believe in a resurrection heard the apostles declaring that Christ had risen from the dead, they were enraged, realizing that if the apostles were allowed to preach a risen Savior and to work miracles in His name, 
the doctrine that they would be no resur- that there would be no resurrection would be rejected by all and the sect of the Sadducees would soon become extinct. This is serious stuff for them. Pull the rug out from under them. The Pharisees were angry as they perceived that the te- perceived that the tendency of the disciples' teaching was to undermine the Jewish ceremonies and make the sacrificial offerings with no effect. Acts of the Apostles 78 paragraph 1. That was their economy. That's yeah. Right. I mean, it was livelihood. That's it's, why they were wealthy. Yeah. They were very astute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. When Caiaphas says, hey, the world get, words, word gets out about this Jesus, the whole world's going to follow after him. And he didn't follow up with, praise the Lord. No, <coughs> you've got to read between the lines. He was saying, we're going to be out of a job. Yeah. Well, and, and, and it wasn't just the, the man at the big gate, beautiful, that was healed. What, was, what were people doing who wanted to be healed? Do you remember? Being healed by Jesus Peter's is dead. Shadow. Jesus is gone. What? We're just getting in Peter's shadow. Yeah. I'm reading Acts 5, verses 15 and 16. As a result of what the apostles were doing, sick people were carried out into the streets and placed on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. And crowds of people came in from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing those who were ill or who had evil spirits in them, and they were all healed. I mean, can you imagine how the Pharisees and the Sadducees felt? Yeah. I mean, is it a wonder why some of them decided they better change sides? (laughs) Oh, wow. Satan must have been incredibly frustrated by this new development. He thought he had almost won the great controversy. Read the first chapter of Desire of Ages before Jesus was born. And after considering the success he had achieved working with Jesus' disciples, Satan had hoped that the work would die out when Jesus was dead. He certainly did not expect what happened next. He must have been stunned to see the change that had come over the disciples. What do you think? Yeah. Well, what happened next in our story? They started arguing about who, was, who got the most food. About whose widows were being taken care of better. And so, what did they do? Chose seven so-called deacons. What do you suppose the background of those deacons was? <coughs> Any idea? They had probably been traveling with Jesus for some time. They probably knew him. It's interesting they that were, they yeah, had Greek names. Yeah, yeah, every one of them had a Greek name. Now, whether they also had Jewish names, Hebrew names, Aramaic names, we don't know. But it's interesting that they're all presented with Greek names. Had they been following Jesus? Maybe so. Well, if you read the sermon that, that uh, Stephen gave, <coughs> it's unbelievable. Stephen was performing great miracles and wonders, it says. What do we know about the synagogue of the freedmen? Remember that he was going around to these synagogues and he was preaching about Jesus. And his arguments were so powerful that nobody could stand up to him. And what is Satan's usual approach if you, if you can't deal with the arguments of your opponents? Eliminate them. Get rid of them. Yeah. Well, this particular synagogue was apparently very influential. I don't know what, how it all had happened. Apparently was filled with former slaves from Cyrene and Libya, Alexandria and Egypt, Cilicia and Asia. But none of them could answer Stephen's arguments. And so I read on, the arguments of the apostles, this again is Acts of the Apostles 45, paragraph 1. The arguments of the apostles alone, though clear and convincing, would not have removed the prejudice that had withstood so much evidence. So, talking about how we, re, we change our preconceived opinions, Gary, this, here's, a, here's a clue. But the Holy Spirit sent the arguments home to hearts with divine power. The words of the apostles were as sharp arrows of the Almighty, convicting men of their terrible guilt and rejecting and crucifying the Lord of glory. How would you feel if you suddenly had tremendous conviction that you had just killed or tried to kill God. (laughs) It certainly turned Paul around, didn't it? Yeah. God turned his 
I guess in some circles you could have called it righteous indignation, but uh, Paul ended up totally focused 180 degrees from where he'd been. Mm -hmm. Well, the end of that Stephen story, I'm reading from Acts 7, verses 59. They kept on stoning Stephen as he called out to the Lord, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not remember this sin against them. He said this and died. And Saul approved of his murder. But that's not the end of that verse. That very day, the church in Jerusalem began to suffer cruel persecution. <coughs> All the believers except the apostles were scattered throughout the province of Judea and Samaria. Some devout men buried Stephen, mourning with him, etc., etc. And what's the, what the conclusion there? At that very day, the 70 weeks allotted to the Jews, remember the 70 week prophecy of Daniel 9 24, came to a completion. A terrible persecution of the Christians began, and the gospel was spread to the Gentiles. Unfortunately, the Christians had to suffer persecution before they were willing to scatter and carry the gospel message to other areas. And where did they carry it? To Jews in other areas. To Jews living in other areas. Not Gentiles, Jews living in other areas. Fortunately, one person who was present at that stoning was later convicted in his heart. I don't know whether it took the lightning bolt from heaven <laughs> or what, but Paul, after the death of Stephen, Saul was elected a member of the Sanhedrin Council in consideration of the part he had acted on that occasion. For a time, he was a mighty instrument in the hands of Satan to carry out his rebellion against the Son of God. But soon this relentless persecutor was to be employed in building up the church that he was now tearing down. A mightier than Satan had chosen Saul to take the place of the martyr Stephen, to preach and suffer for his name and to spread far and wide the tidings of salvation through his blood. Acts of the Apostles 1 and 2, paragraph 1. Wow. So, incredible as it might seem, as a result of the death of Stephen, we have the conversion of Saul. How often do really good things happen because of really bad things? Well, how is it you're ascribing the death of Stephen as the conversion of Saul when <coughs> he went on Saul was uh, on a little donkey ride and uh, Jesus shows up and strikes him blind? How do you, what's this got to do with the... Uh, well, here, here's, here's again, and um, I, again, I, I, I got this from Ellen White. She says he's, he's well, uh, you don't even have to go to Ellen White because what did Jesus say? It's hard. Paul himself reports, <coughs> the angel said to him, uh, the light said to him, the voice said to him, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. What does that mean? Brought into the Holy Spirit? Yeah. yeah. He, was, he was struggling all that, uh, I don't know whether it was a year or how long it took, but for however long it would, took before finally that Damascus experience, he was fighting with his conscience because he had a conviction from that experience he could not get Stephen out of his mind. So when we ascribe the conversion of Paul to simply that experience on the road, yeah. we are uh, <coughs> we're succumbing to some preconceived ideas. Yeah. Yes. Well, that, think this, about it for a moment. Yeah, this, this, this was just the final uh, yeah. crowning act on this on this uh, time of, yeah. of, of uh, conversion. How far is it from Jerusalem to Damascus? I don't know. 100 miles or so? About 150 miles, yeah. something like that. Paul, as a Pharisee, traveled with what kind of people to get to Damascus? It was Roman soldiers, wasn't it? Either Roman soldiers or maybe Jewish kind of, some kind of soldiers. Uh, under the behest of the Sanhedrin to arrest Christians and bring them back again. Okay? Was Paul allowed to talk to those people? Probably not. Not according to Pharisaical tradition anyway. Now what he really did we don't know, but I suspect he spent a lot of time thinking as he was walking. And I think God waited until he'd done a lot of thinking and he said, okay, boom! And Paul says, okay, I give up. Well, he could, he couldn't see what was going on either, so he's kind of at the mercy of whoever's <laughs> looking after him, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Well, then we come to the story of Peter with Cornelius. What do we know about that story? <coughs> Jews didn't eat with... Well, several things that are shocking about that story. First of all, Peter is staying in the house of a tanner. What do tanners do? Handled animal skins. Dead animals. Dead animals yes. all every day, and they were perpetually unclean, according to Jewish custom beliefs. I would guess very smelly, if you've ever heard. Probably that too. Gone by a place that processes animal skins in, in yeah. the end of a killing house. It's not pretty. Yeah. Okay. So these guys show up, and what do they say about Cornelius? Here's here's somebody who's just waiting to be baptized, basically. He's helped the Jews. He, he, he's already a follower of the way. And Peter's still not sure whether he should go talk to this guy. I mean, think about it. You know? But finally, he goes with his friends. They go up there. You would think with all of the success he'd had previously of healing all these people, yeah. that this would be a, kind of a piece of cake. Yeah. Well, what did Peter do when he was on his way from Joppa? He took a bunch of people with him. Why did he take a bunch of people with him? Covered him legally. It, it covered him when he got back to Jerusalem, exactly. I mean, think about it. These are the church leaders we're talking about. Okay. So what happens when he gets attacked back in Jerusalem? Acts 11, the apostles and the other believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. When Peter went to Jerusalem, those who were in favor of circumcising Gentiles criticized him. Now, who's, who are we talking about? We're talking about church leaders here, saying, you were a guest in the home of uncircumcised Gentiles, and you even ate with them. Now, you mean Christian church leaders? Yes. Like James. Like James. I hope it's not John, too. But, and some of those Pharisees and Sadducees we were talking about who had become Christians. So Peter gave them a complete account of what had happened from the very beginning. And he goes through the whole story. If you drop down here to verse um, 17, it is clear that God gave those Gentiles the same gift that he gave us, that is the Holy Spirit, when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was, who was I then to stop, try to stop God? Okay, now well, how do you respond to that? When they heard this, they stopped their criticism <laughs> and praised God, saying, then God has given to the Gentiles also the opportunity to repent and live? Amazing! So, at the end of time, are Christ's followers going to represent him better than the apostles did? I hope so. Can they, they, this lesson fall is one of 13 in, a, in an entire quarter Mm -hmm. on the study of the great controversy. Mm -hmm. And so how does this fit in with, how does, how does this identify with, the, how do we see the great controversy manifesting itself here in, these, in okay. these stories? Well, I see several things. One I see is how incredibly difficult it was to get the disciples to really on the same page with Jesus in terms of spreading the gospel to the whole world. I mean, this is years after Pentecost. And I mean, look at Galatians 2. Maybe we shouldn't take time to read that, but when Peter came to Antioch, Paul says, I opposed him in public because he was clearly wrong. And, you know, he's still acting like we should only preach the gospel to Jews years later. This so, is even what? after Cornelius, right? This is, this is after Cornelius, yeah. But we're... I don't, it seems like somehow we, there is there's something unique about the understanding of the great controversy and how it affects our lives on here. Yeah. What, what is that? How is that the great controversy? Well, it represents, I, I think it, it, it should tell us how incredibly successful Satan has been in, in infiltrating the Christian church. I mean, I hate to, to put it in those terms, but I'm just reading what it says here. And what happens when we finally make a breakthrough? Look at this, Acts 11, verse 19. Some of the believers who were scattered by the persecution, we read about that a little bit ago, which took place when Stephen was killed, went as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message to Jews only. What are they still doing? 
preaching the gospel only to Jews. But other believers who were from Cyprus and Cyrene, where is Cyrene? Libya. In Libya. Cyprus and Libya went to Antioch, now that had become sort of the new lead church for the Christian for, the, for Christians, and that was the home church now for Peter, for, for Paul and Barnabas and Silas, and he worked later, worked, this was their home church. Other believers who were from Cyprus and Libya went to Antioch and proclaimed the message to Gentiles also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. Lord's power with, was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. I'm sure and of course, what happened? The news about this reached, reached Jerusalem. They said, rush up there quick and figure out what in the world is going on. Are these people really preaching the gospel freely and openly to Gentiles? So what we see here is even after, even after Satan has watched what has happened on the cross and sees things that are pretty well defeated, is generally the way we would interpret that, mm -hmm. He still thinks he can, he still thinks there's hope here. He is, he is determined by every means possible to defeat the church. Yeah. This is an all-out war. Well, how successful has the Seventh-day Adventist church been at removing cultural, linguistic, and racial prejudices? Are we good at recognizing those prejudices even in ourselves? I think we're better than we used to be. Better, I think better than we used to be. Well, the Russian... I huh? know we're pretty sensitive about Muslim folk these days. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And some of them are pretty sensitive about having women lead, up in, lead out in the church too. Uh, the Russian author Fyodor Dostoevsky said these words, and this is from our uh, adult teacher Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. Russian author Fyodor Dostoevsky wrote about Jesus returning to the earth, but not as predicted in the Bible. Instead, in this made-up story, this is a fictitious story, but think about what he says. Jesus returned at the height of the Inquisition when religious leaders used their power for evil. The Grand Inquisitor had Jesus, who came as a humble peasant, arrested and thrown in a dungeon. That night he visited Jesus in jail and castigated him for giving humans freedom. Quote, instead of taking men's freedom from them, he declares, thou didst make it greater than ever. Didst thou forget that men, man prefers peace and even death to freedom of choice and the knowledge of good and evil? Nothing is more seductive from man to his freedom of conscience, but nothing is a greater cause of suffering. What does that tell us about freedom? Oh God is absolutely committed to it. Yeah. That's the way he is. He's, God and is love. you got to have freedom. And, he, and as a result, he has struggled and struggled and struggled with human beings. <clears throat> God doesn't want to control and manipulate and put people under duress or extortion mm -hmm. or anything like that. So, Jay, getting back to your question, what it tells mm -hmm. us is that really challenging times are ahead of us. If God, I mean, if Satan did these things in the past, what's he going to do in the future? Clearly, we're told it's going to be the worst that's ever been. Times will be worse than they've ever been before. And God has a plan, because the Holy Spirit is alive and well is also. And he wants to act and in our lives and in our minds. And I, and I quote again, this is from Ellen White, Christ's Object Lessons, page 330. God will accept only those who are determined to aim high. He places every human agent under obligation to do his best. Moral perfection is required of all. Now this isn't a reason for being scared, this is a reason for saying we need help. Never should we lower the standard of righteousness in order to accommodate inherited or cultivated tendencies to wrongdoing. You think your, 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 your evils, your problems are inherited? God will help you overcome them. You think they're cultivated? God will help you overcome them. We need to understand that imperfection of character is sin. All righteous attributes of character dwell in God as a perfect, harmonious whole, and everyone who receives Christ as a personal Savior is privileged to possess these attributes. 
God wants to give them to us. Well, try to just think back to the disciples again. Think about the diversity there was among the disciples. Did Jesus intentionally want that much diversity? The apostles, and again, I'm quoting now from Ellen White. This is uh, Desire of Ages 296, paragraph 2. The apostles differed widely in habits and disposition. They were the publican, Levi Matthew, and the fiery zealot, Simon, the uncompromising hater of the authority of Rome, the generous, impulsive Peter, and the mean-spirited Judas, Thomas, the true-hearted yet timid and fearful, Philip, slow of heart and inclined to doubt, and the ambitious, outspoken sons of Zebedee with their brethren. These were brought together with their different faults, all with inherited and cultivated tendencies to evil, but in, in and through Christ they were to dwell in the family of God, learning to become one in faith, in doctrine, in spirit. They would have their tests, their grievances, their differences of opinion, but while Christ was abiding in the heart, there could be no dissension. His love would lead to love for one another. The lessons of the Master would lead to the harmonizing of all differences, bringing the disciples into unity till they would uh, be of one mind and one judgment. Christ is the great center, and they, were, they would approach one another just in proportion as they approached the center. And again, this is now of another one. Um, this is 671, paragraph 2. In describing to his disciples the office work of the Holy Spirit, Jesus sought to inspire them with the joy and hope that inspired his own heart. He rejoiced because of the abundant help he had provided for his church. The Holy Spirit was the highest of all gifts that he could solicit from his Father for the exaltation of his people. The Spirit was to be given as a regenerating agent, and without this the sacrifice of Christ would have been of no avail. The power of evil had been strengthened for, strengthening for centuries, and the submission of men to this satanic captivity was amazing. Sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead who would come with no modified power, but in the fullness of divine power. Well, I don't know what you have thought of the lesson that we have had today. Uh, you can get our handouts by going to our website, as you probably already know. But these are incredibly challenging times for us, the times in which we live. A kind and loving Father, we thank you for the divine revelations that we've been able to share today. May we come to love you more, respect you more, and be more open to the work of the Holy Spirit as a result of this study is our prayer in Jesus' name.